Get all this. All right, welcome everyone to the third installment of this semester's Appalachian Natural History Seminar Series. We're delighted to have um, Dr. Glenn Henderson um, with us today, um, sharing with us about Native peoples um, and their influence or their relationship with the landscape. So very excited um, to have you come and share with us. Um, thank you so much for your time and sharing your wisdom with us. And we will have some time for Q&A at the end, so take, have your notepads ready and um, get those questions ready to ask at the end. Um, I'm sure Dr. Henderson will be delighted to answer, entertain any questions that you have. And if you want to go ahead and get your um, uh, slides pulled up, you should have permission to do that. Okay, gonna, I'll try that now. I'm going to flip There's the camera so you can see the class. Item. Share from beginning. Ooh. Go. Can you guys see that? Yes. Yeah, it looks, it's looking good. Ancient people in the land. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you, Dr. Senna, for inviting me here. I uh, Can everyone hear me? Am I speaking close enough to my mic? All right, great. Okay, so... Um, I was really thrilled to be asked to come and talk to you all about this. Um, I am an archeologist. I work um, in the Ohio Valley, but particularly in Kentucky. And um, this issue of trying to correct misperceptions of native peoples and their relationship, oops, One thing I forgot, of course, a phone. Um, the relationships of native people to um, the environment and the, the myth of um, virgin forest. Um, and so I was really thrilled to see these um, readings that you were assigned for today and other days in this particular section of your course. Um, I felt that Susan Yarnell had done a very fine job generally discussing native history. Um, the ancient fires at Cliff Palace Pond and the, the booklet that goes along with it really does a fine job um, describing the the parallel histories that Cliff Palace Pond de deposits held for um, environmental history and native history to a point, and, um, and also gave you a sense of how do we know what kinds of data and how did the archeologists and paleo uh, ecologists collect the data and interpret the data to, to make their uh, interpretations. I had never seen um, the article the role of indigenous burning in land management. And I read it with much interest because it is much more wide ranging. Uh, items that I read in preparation for writing the booklet on Cliff Palace Pond, um, I read more focused in the Southeast and so forth and the Midwest and, and the Northeast, but not so much the, the, the broader perspective and the native um, in, ethnographic information that, that those folks presented. And I was really pleased to see that one of the authors is a native, uh, is an indigenous person. However, so after I read that, I thought to myself, well, shoot, what am I gonna say to these guys? I mean, I've read all this kind of stuff and everything. What am I, what can I say different? Or what can I add? Or what can I do to challenge your, your thoughts, conceptions and so forth? And as I looked at those items and thought about some of the information that I could present to you that you may not have heard of or may never have heard of since some of the research here is done by colleagues of mine and I that we are in the process of publishing about now, I, I thought, well, this, this will have some relevance here for your class. So I came up with these four topics to consider terminology to discuss an important topic, which is Sweden agriculture, 
provide you some other Kentucky examples relating to Native peoples and the environment, and then highlight broader interaction between Native peoples in Kentucky and the natural environment, which goes beyond uh, particularly plants and animals because the environment is linked to soils, uh, climate, a, um, a elevation, and so forth. So let me begin with the first thing that I wanted to discuss with you, and that is the terminology. Now, on the one hand, you might say, yeah, yeah, who cares? What, what difference do words make? But we, we know words make a difference. Words can confuse, they can deny, they can misrepresent. And so these three words were ones that I wanted to um, bring to your attention to consider as honors students. Early human interaction, pre-settlement and prehistory. These are terms that you will have run across uh, in the context of this course. Okay. Early human interaction. Well, for me as an archeologist, early human interaction means 14,000 to 10,000 BC. That's what I mean by early. As an archeologist, I see time as something really long, really long. And so when I saw early human interaction, I interpreted that as we're going to discuss what the very first hunter gatherers, how they impacted the environment. But that's not really true. Really the concept was early meaning before Europeans arrived. What you see here on, on your screen are a variety of lifeways scenes for the four main uh, life ways and time periods in Kentucky's native history prior to the arrival of Europeans. The first hunter gatherers, the later hunter gatherers, the gardening peoples and the farming peoples from 14,000 BC up to AD 1750. One of the terms that I find, frankly, as an archeologist, infuriating when I see the term pre-settlement. People oftentimes use the term pre-settlement, but if you're talking pre-settlement and settlement meaning humans on the landscape, then you would be talking before 14,000 BC. Settlement, human settlement. In these articles that in the, the particular article that, that we read, um, the role of indigenous burning. It's a standard statement to use pre-settlement. The inference is before people got here, or at least that's the way I read it. What they really mean is pre-European settlement, not pre-human settlement, which would be during the ice ages before the very first people came across the Bering Strait and came down into Kentucky and other parts of, of the Western Hemisphere. So it's a very important um, term to use correctly. I don't know. This is like so. Okay. It's it, it's an important it's an important distinction which also feeds on the distinction of prehistory. Now, I will tell you that I am as, as I've, I've made this mistake. I have used this term prehistory for most of my career as an archeologist, but it has been, I would say in the last several years, maybe four years, where I've realized that using the term prehistory implies only history is written down in documents. I would contend, I would ask you to consider that if history is the sum total of human activity on the land, just like natural history is the natural plants and animals through time, 
human history is humans through time and archaeological sites and the artifacts that are present in those archaeological sites, as well as the oral histories of Native peoples today. There's no such thing as prehistory. Prehistory is a term that links importance of historical events exclusively to the written word. And that is not a true fact. Activities, important actions, significant things happened in human history that are not recorded in documents written in writing, but are recorded in the land and in traditions held by Native peoples today. So these three terms, early human interaction, pre-settlement and pre-history give us an, an in, these are inappropriate vocabulary words to use when we're talking about Native peoples and their interaction with a natural environment throughout time. I'll be honest with you, it's very easy for me to fall back into the use of prehistory. I have to stop myself, watch myself every time. There is a friend of mine who whenever I say it, he glares at me. You'd think I would be getting better at this and I am trying. So I pass that on to you. My second uh, topic that I'd like to cover today is an important topic about Swidden agriculture. In these uh, readings, for a number of reasons, Swidden agriculture wasn't presented um, in much detail. For example, in the video and the booklet, the farming peoples, the native farming peoples didn't live in the Keener Point Knob area, they lived someplace else. And so the booklet and the video didn't discuss that. The focus of um, the uh, Kimmerer and Lake um, article is focusing more on, I think, or appears to me to be focusing more on the impact of fire on the uh, plants and animals of the forest and so forth, and not so much, certainly not the mechanics of Swidden agriculture or horticulture. And then um, the, the overview by um, Yarnell discusses farming, but doesn't explain what farming is and how native farming impacted the environment. And I want you guys to be aware of what that did. Okay, so the native people who domesticated uh, plants in Kentucky around, starting around 3000 BC, um, were gardeners, they weren't farmers, unless your definition of farming is planting seeds to grow. And in that case, this is agriculture, just a different form of it. And this image shows you these um, Eastern agricultural complex plants here in, here in the center, sunflower, goosefoot, maygrass, and so forth. Yes, they used fire. They used uh, technology that would be just saving the seeds, broadcast sowing those seeds uh, on garden plots, small areas, opened up in the forest by fire using a digging stick. It's important for you to realize that this domestication of native plants is something that has happened in a variety of places in the world. In fact, in six places in the world, China, the Middle East, Africa, Mexico, Peru, and the Eastern woodlands of North America. And the archeological sites in Kentucky have contributed enormous amounts of information to our understanding of native people's interaction with the environment and their, their role as, as domesticators of, of native plants. These plants uh, produce starchy seeds like goosefoot and maygrass. 
or oily seeds like sunfat flour and marsh elder. And they also domesticated local, local plant, local squash plants. These plants provided marvelous nutritional value for the native peoples. So in combination with the animals that they hunted, the wild plants that they grew and the plants that they uh, collected, they had a really, very, um, a really, a really good diet. Okay. When the farmers begin growing corn, beans, and squash, particularly in central Kentucky, which is the area that I'm most familiar with, they decide not to really fool around much with um, some of the native plants that they had domestic that their ancestors had domesticated, and they threw threw um, threw those away or decided just not to focus on them. And they really focused on corn and squash that had that had been around for a long time, a little bit of goosefoot, a little bit of sunflower, and then later on after 1200 A.D. beans. These folks used fire as well, but the scale of their impact on the environment was significantly larger than the impact of the gardens had on the environment. In the lower left-hand corner, you can see the steps or the cycle of Swidden agriculture. You start in a forest, you girdle the trees, you burn the undergrowth, you plant your plants, and then after a time, you let it go fallow. You move your field to another spot. Forest grows up, you may burn it again, and, and the, the, this process continues. Based on archeological research and ethno-historic research in the Eastern woodlands, we know that Swidden agriculture um, was a very effective, it was a very sustainable way of growing food. And the villages that these people lived in, these farmers lived in, would move about, well, anywhere between every 10 years <clears throat> to one, once every 25 years because of the less, I guess you would say, the, the, um, the production of their fields would have fallen off enough that they could justify the disruption of moving everybody to another, to another village. The picture that you see in the upper left-hand corner is an aerial view of Swidden agriculture. Now, if you could imagine that in Kentucky, this picture is actually from a place in Asia, or the ground view, which is in the um, middle on the right, Swidden agriculture. The native peoples interplanted corn, beans, and squash in their fields. This was not monocropping, very sustainable, and what you, what you see in the upper left-hand corner is a, is a patchwork quilt of fallow fields, active fields, and the forest growing back up. Now consider that there was 700 years worth of Sweden agriculture impact on the land in Kentucky from these farming peoples. It's significant and it's sustained. And what kind of technology did they use? The same old digging stick, but they also used hoes, ones made from heavy duty freshwater mussel shells, which you can see an example uh, with a hafted handle in the upper part of the slide, examples of what these hoes look like when recovered from an archeological site in the bottom right. But they also used elk or deer scapula or shoulder blade hoes to hoe as well. And we know this because we find evidence of these tools 
in archaeological sites where these village farming people lived. Okay. This system of corn, beans, and squash is called Three Sisters Agricultural System. Many of you may have read, heard about this already. With fire, the function of the corn as the nitrogen taking, the function of the beans as nitrogen fixing, the squash grows down along the ground, holds the moisture. There's multiple ways. This is just one example in the upper right-hand corner, example of planting, interplanting in these fields. I think, particularly taking a look at this one picture here on the right, I mean, it, you look at it and go, come on people, really, is that a field? I mean, really, it looks, looks like it's, it's not very tidy. Well, no, it's not very tidy. It's not about tidy. It's about growing food and sustaining yourselves as farmers in your environment. Okay. Sweden, agriculture, significant impact on Kentucky's landscape to a point where some folks, some folks have suggested that the reason why the bluegrass looked so very unique when the earliest frontiersmen arrived was, the, was showing the impact of 700 years of native farming. And it's not just in the bluegrass either. Native farmers lived in Eastern Kentucky in the mountains. Their villages were along the floodplains. Yes, those floodplains are very narrow, but those folks had villages along the floodplains, the Big Sandy, um, the Ohio, um, the Kentucky River, in those in those um, in those floodplains, and their fields would have been along the floodplains, but also up on the ridges, and maybe on some of the slopes as well, because we do have historic evidence of people um, historically growing uh, crops on the slopes. Certainly, the uh, the erosion wasn't so very good, <laughs> but anyway. The, the, the possibility exists that they were using not just the floodplain contexts, but also the ridgetops and the slopes. Okay, now I'd like to provide you uh, another Kentucky example of um, impact on the landscape from uh, a particular archeological site that I've investigated uh, over the course of many years. Let me see what time it is. Okay, good. I'm going to talk about black locust wood preference in house construction, deer hunting strategies changing over time, and turkey flock management. Okay, I'm talking now about the Fort Ancient farming peoples who lived in central and eastern Kentucky from about 1000 AD until about 1750. Their villages were circular initially, and then later on were scattered houses across the landscape. I have a picture of that uh, in, the, in another slide. They lived in villages in the summertime, in the, in the fall, in the winter, able-bodied people went out into hunting camps. And that's an artist's image of a hunting camp you know, on the bottom uh, of the slide. The uh, women, children, older people lived in the village year round and able-bodied folks went out on the hunting. Uh, to the hunting camps in, in the fall and winter. The name of the site is Fox Farm and it's located in Mason County, which is north of Lexington, not too far from the North Fork of the Licking River, which you can see here located on this topographic map on the left. An aerial photo on the right shows you the size of the village, um, actually villages, we've documented four different native villages there um, on this rise near um, Lee's Creek is the closest creek to the village and the, or villages. <clears throat> and then the North Fork is the largest uh, nearby creek. There were springs nearby as well. Okay, what's very interesting about Fox Farm, I just finished telling you that native peoples engaged in Sweden agriculture, moved their villages every 10 to 25 years. That is a true fact. 
until it comes to Fox Farm. And we don't understand why this is part of our research question, but here's what we know. Based on the radiocarbon dates, and we have a suite of over 30 radiocarbon dates from contexts at this village site, these village sites, we know that native people, native farming peoples moved to this ridge around 1200 AD, and they didn't leave until around 600. More or less 350 years. This is not normal. Why did they live there for that long? What is up? How do we explain this? How did these people sustain themselves for 300 years? Okay, even if in argument's sake, we say, well, okay, maybe they were there and then left and came back multiple times. Still, still the impact of 500 to 600 people in a village is going to have an impact on the local environment. How did they manage this? What did they do? How did they impact the land? How did they deal with their own impact on the land? Well, we have three ideas. Um, one of the ideas is that their sustainable horticulture, their sustainable farming uh, created um, these large agricultural fields, these large plots. And on the edges of these fields was the perfect browse environment for turkey and deer and early succession trees to come back in, in the fallow fields. So from a certain perspective, their farming impacted the local environment to enhance the appropriate habitat for certain animals that they depended on. Deer was the, one of the main ones, turkey, one of the main birds that they hunted. Also, other animals were raccoons and squirrels, rabbits, bear, elk, certain reptiles and amphibians and things like that. But the browse habitat for, um, for deer and turkey, and frankly for raccoons as well, interfingers with the edge environment that was enhanced, in, in, increased by these multiple fields in and around the village. Okay, one of the first successional trees to come back in a fallow context in that area is black locust. And you can see a picture of black locust there on the slide. Okay, native peoples at Fox Farm selected black locust as their wood of choice for the frameworks for their houses. And it wasn't just because black locust was kind of cool or black locust was one of the first ones to come back in or whatever. Black locust is a fast growing, so it's a, it's a secondary um, arrival colonizing tree, but it's also disease resistant. And in doing more re research, we discovered that even now farmers will prefer black locust wood for their fences their fence poles because it's such a disease resistant wood. Now, we know that the Fort Ancient people at Fox Farm used oak and hickory as wood for their uh, houses as well. And you had seen a picture of the houses there on this slide in the upper left. Bark covered uh, the framework of black locust, but sometimes oak and hickory as well. And how did we know this? Because we find the charred remains of these wood species in the holes left from the burned, da burned down houses. We have fragments of charcoal and in an in a humid environment like Kentucky, the wood has to be burned in order to preserve. And we save this, save these samples, give them to a person who specializes in this kind of research called an archaeobotanist. He looks underneath the microscope, 
He sees what kind of trees they are because different hardwoods have different looks beneath a mic underneath a microscope. And he noted that in those contexts, in those, in those posts where the posts were and had burned in place, the majority of them were black locust. Okay, so that's, that's one piece of information. Okay, second, I told you about deer hunting change. Okay, so Fox Farm has been occupied for a long time. And we know which one of the villages on this ridge is the first one and the second and the third and the fourth. We know that by changes in the pottery styles, but also from the radiocarbon dates. Okay, so because of the nature of the soil at Fox Farm, animal bones preserve really well. And we have a huge, huge collection of well-preserved animal bone that provides us with an opportunity to look at and ask questions that uh, you don't ordinarily be able to ask because of preservation problems. Well, we compared and contrasted the age at death of the deer being taken and their trash being deposited at Fox Farm. And those of you who are hunters will know that you can tell how old uh, a deer is from the tooth eruption. You can tell if it's a young deer, an old deer, uh, an ancient deer from the way that the teeth look. And we were able to determine that over time, the native peoples, let me make sure I have my fact correct here. We know that over time, there was a focus on taking older deer and taking fewer younger deer based on the proportions of deer eruptions for age of the deer that were deposited in the trash pits at the site. Okay, and the next one has to do with the turkeys. Okay, we know that deer bones, uh, turkey bones show sexual, sexual dimorphism in the humerus, which is the upper arm bone. You can see it there, the picture of the turkey, where the humerus is. Females smaller, males large. Again, we have a large sample of turkey bones that we can analyze. And what we did, what we found was a kind of interesting pattern and we thought, what? So we did some more research and we did a comparison between our site, Fox Farm, which is occupied for a really long time, as I've told you, and a contemporary farming village that was occupied for a, the usual expected amount of time, 10 years, 20 years, something like that. And what we found at the site that was occupied for the regular amount of time, 10 to 25 years, equal numbers of males and female turkeys taken. Just as many, just as many males as females, 50-50. At Fox Farm, there were twice as many males taken than females, which made a higher than normal ratio of females to males in, in a natural turkey population. So it is our interpretation that they were killing surplus males to not overhunt the females and not wanting to cast dispersion on men and at any for any reason but you only need a couple two three males to a million hens in a turkey population so the idea is to keep the hens producing and cull out the males that's turkey management and we have evidence of that at fox farm these these farming peoples were managing the turkey herds, which is turkey flocks, <laughs> management of the turkey flocks at Fox Farm, environmental impact long ago in central Kentucky and in Eastern Kentucky, I expect, but we need to do more research regarding that linked to the length of time these villages have been occupied. Okay. And my last topic is, I want to highlight broader interaction with the natural environment. And these are the various themes that I'm going to, to, to focus on briefly because I need to leave time for conversation. Okay. Domestic and ritual building construction, mound and earthwork construction, the different raw materials that native peoples used and mineral mining in the caves of Kentucky. All right. 
here is the artist's reconstruction of what Fox Farm would have look, looked like towards the end of its occupation. Not a circle, but a scatter of houses along the ridgetop. And what you see in this artist's reconstruction based on the work that we've done at Fox Farm are domestic and a ritual house in this village. The long houses with smoke coming out of them scattered about, those are the domestic houses. And the ritual building is the one with the three in the sort of in the center of the image with the three um, bird forms on top of poles sticking up above the house. Native peoples, as I said before, use wood and bark for the construction of their houses. And they would have cut down trees for their houses and for their ritual buildings. The one with the um, birds on top of the poles, that one is the public structure. It's a place where the chief and ritual activities um, would have occurred uh, during the lifetime of the village. Okay, so Native peoples are going out into the woods to cut down, to select certain trees, their bark, their wood uh, for construction. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not going to reuse certain um, portions of houses when they rebuild, but there are gonna be some, um, just like any house, it needs to be refurbished from time to time. And these houses would get um, riddled with insects and vermin and they would um, fall down and have to be replaced. They would be moving, you know, in other, in other, in other sites, they would have been moving um, to different locations, rebuilding, constantly rebuilding. And so a certain amount of impact on the, on the immediate vicinity of the village uh, is on the woods is going to be because of the building construction. Not, I mean, I haven't said a thing, about fuel load and the collection of wood for fuel. And just because in this humid environment that we live in in Kentucky, which does not preserve in an open site like this on a ridge, the wooden tools, the wooden implements that these people used, it doesn't mean they didn't have. Them. And so a host of diverse, purposes the wood is put to use for. Building, fuel, technologies, and that's going to have an impact on the surrounding environment in addition to the impact that is felt by the Sweden uh, agriculture that they are engaging in. Then we have mound and earthwork construction. Now I've skipped back in time to about the time of Christ. And what you see here are uh, the hunter-gatherer gardening people's ritual sites. A burial mound in the upper left-hand corner, an artist reconstruction of a log-lined tomb, and uh, a mound and earthwork um, complex in, um, in Greenup County. The native people are digging soil to build these mounds, local impact. They are cutting trees down to serve as the walls of their log lined tombs. The mound that you see here is being excavated during the WPA uh, depression era in the 1930s. Uh, they encountered over 100 graves in this mound and several tombs. In order to build the mound, you have to clear the area. In order to build the mound, you have to dig the soil up and carry it in basket loads 
to build the mound. These are impacts on the environment. Doesn't have anything to do necessarily with fire, but it has to do with human landscape interaction. The example of the uh, Portsmouth Earthworks, this enclosure and extended arms from it, which is the photo that you, the image that you see on the uh, right hand side. This is uh, Squire and Davis's early 1800s map of, um, of this portion of the Portsmouth Earthworks. It's very accurate. And in the WPA times, archaeologists did some excavation in selected areas in the square. Uh, one excavation was along one of the arms in the sort of the, the, would be the southern part um, of the arm, southern arm, but in selected areas in the square. The area uh, in the, let's see, I, sh I, I should tell you that this square is oriented, as you can tell from the <clears throat> north arrow, the square is oriented north-south to the cardinal directions. The southern corner, the excavation in the southern corner documented through uh, examination of the soil profile, the soil, the types of soils, their color, their texture, and so forth. The archaeologists could determine that the native peoples had cut the, the, the existing terrace edge. They were going to have this square oriented north-south or know the reason why. And so what they did was decided, well, okay, this is the way we're gonna put it. And this is very fine, except we can't, we can't build it the way we want to right in this particular area because we've got this, this terrace, this bump, this ridge. So what they did is simply cut it away. No, they didn't have backhoes. They didn't have, you know, scoops, nothing like that. It was them, their, their digging sticks, their, their, their cane baskets and the strength of their own backs to cut the soil and they took it and filled in certain ravines elsewhere in that area. So it was an earth moving experience to create this enclosure the way they wanted it to be oriented on the land. This is an impact. This is a human land interaction. Um, in order for them to realize their vision for their ceremonies, for their rituals, for their beliefs. Native peoples used the raw materials available to them in the environment. These folks are Stone Age people, they use stone for their weapons and tools, scrapers, knives, arrowheads, spear points, and so forth. And because of the nature of the rocks that underlay the Kentucky landscape, limestone, chert or flint occurs naturally, either as nodules, like you know, big baseball or bowling ball size nodules or layers in the limestone. Chert holds a sharp edge when you nap it and the diversity of high quality chert in Kentucky meant that these native peoples had a just a mar a Kmart of chert or flint if you will and they were able to um, uh, exploit these rocks for their stone tools. Arrowheads like these and spear points like these. I think it's important for you all to realize that when we think of native peoples, we just oftentimes usually just think of bow and arrow. Well, the bow and arrow is a perfectly fine weapon, don't get me wrong, but native peoples began using the bow and arrow in Kentucky and elsewhere in the, um, uh, in the Eastern woodlands around 700 AD. 
And yet we know that native peoples have been in Kentucky since 14,000 BC. So what's up with that? Well, native peoples used another kind of weapon system called the atlatl or spear thrower. And they used chert or flint for their spear points as well. You can see how uh, a native man would use a spear thrower to throw a spear for hunting. The breakdown of the weapon is there on the lower right hand corner and the lower left hand corner is a picture of the different spear points, all of them made from chert or flint, recovered from chert sources. Sometimes the chert occurred in such high quantities that it was really like a, um, a mining operation. You go in and you get the, uh, the rock and do some, some, some minor shaping and then take it back to your village or camp and finish up the tool. Or other times you would go into the river where the nodules or fragments of chert uh, would have eroded into the creeks and rivers and then rolled down stream and, and get the source of rock that way. Native peoples beginning around a thousand um, BC started making uh, pottery and they used locally available clay sources for the pots that they made. Here, there, here are examples of ceramic, these are fragments of ceramic cooking jars with their handles and decoration used for cooking and storage. Here are other examples, earlier examples of, um, of native pottery. They would go to the clay sources, dig the clay out, bring it back to their village and, and make the pots, fire the pots uh, outside. So that's another uh, use of, of fuel, aside from cooking food and for warmth, you would need it to, uh, to fire your ceramic vessels. And then finally, I thought it was important for you all, I didn't wanna forget the caves. You know, when you think of Kentucky, you think of caves. And I wanted you all to know that native people's interaction with the environment wasn't just above ground, it was also below ground too, for ritual and for mineral mining. Evidence in Mammoth Cave, archeologists have found, evidence for um, the mining of selenite and marabolite in Mammoth Cave. These folks uh, came into the cave using scrapers made from freshwater mussel shells, uh, scraping the selenite off the walls. They've documented these places where they've, where they've done the scraping uh, and would have used the mineral either for paint or as a diuretic. You can see other items of native technology in this uh, artist's reconstruction. Cane torches, uh, slippers made from rattlesnake master um, a kind of yucca-like uh, or agave-like plant that grew in Kentucky or grows, grows in Kentucky, a native plant. They also would bring gourds down to the, um, into the cave with them for uh, water and so forth. And they would cache um, the water and cave um, cane bundles. So they would have it to go even deeper into the cave to mine for selenite. They also use these caves ritually. There are evident, there is evidence of um, pictures either painted or drawn on the cave walls. There is one cave in Warren County where glyphs were, were carved into the mud on the floor of the cave. Um, the interpretation is that some of these caves were ritually used for um, initiation ceremonies. Um, the detritus from native people's uh, visits to these caves is just everywhere. Um, if those of you who have been to Mammoth Cave haven't seen it, well, it's, it's because it's off, off the trail. The archeologists have, have done uh, a many years long um, research project to document where all the different fragments of fiber and 
burned cane torches and blown out sandals and places where they've gone to the bathroom, places where gourds are, water gourds throughout the cave. Um, they've documented all of that so that the folks at the National Park Service can manage the protection and preservation of this significant resource, amazing place. So let me just close in saying that the native peoples and their natural environment um, was a dynamic and symbiotic relationship. The native peoples did for the forests, and we've read in these articles how the health of the forests um, depends on humans and fire. Um, but there are other elements of the environment that native peoples used and impacted throughout time in, in, different, degree, in different degrees or perhaps uh, in different intensities in different places through time because native history, as, as you remember, begins thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, but it's, it's something to remember when we, when we drive down the road, when we go into the forest, I know that you all will be having a field trip to go and plant trees uh, as part of your class um, this semester. And, and I'd like you to think um, just a little bit about being in the landscape that was theirs and is now ours and how the responsibility for the health of that forest and that environment has passed from them to us. And um, we live in a dynamic and symbiotic relationship with the forest and the environment too. And um, I'm just really thrilled to think that you guys will be putting into action uh, some kind of, some, some really sim significant action to enhance and improve and help reestablish that relationship uh, with the forests uh, in Eastern Kentucky. Thank okay, so I'll, stop, I'll stop my share now. And we should have, oh, some time, oops. Let's give Dr. Henderson a warm round of applause for her fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I don't want to keep um, any of y'all who have to go on to your next appointment, but we will take, we, you know, we'll hang out and ask questions. Dr. Henderson, if you have a few more minutes. To oh yeah, questions. gosh, I, I didn't think that last section was going to go so long. Sorry, guys. Shoot. Oh, it was just so interesting. We all lost track of time. Um, questions? Yeah, hey, and if you just mind coming up, you can ask your question. I'll maybe camp the camera around so you can see me a little bit better. If you want to just kind of stand over here, sorry, the camera's over here, and, and then this is the microphone, so, sorry. I feel like okay, I, gotta, yeah. I, I want to scrunch down, you know, so I can, okay. Hi. Yeah. So I checked out your speaker bio before I came to class today, and I saw that you were a children's nonfiction author. So I was yeah. just curious how you like diluted these like scientific concepts down to where a child can understand it when you're writing. That's 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 the trick, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean that's the trick. Well, part of part of what I've done is I have taken, uh, like for example, the um, Cliff Palace Pond booklet. I turned it into an article for a children's magazine simpler words, shorter sentences, but communicating the, the excitement, the interest. I mean, Cliff Palace Pond is a really cool place. I mean, get out. You can see side by side the environmental history and the native history intertwined, interfingering, telling us the story of the place. It's just amazing. So it was a it was an article of sort of focusing more on the fire because the magazine was, the topic of the magazine was about fire. And so um, the, the challenge is to make it uh, interesting, but you know, at the risk of sounding rude here, archeology span is like so interesting. I mean, what do I have to do, right? I mean, it's just so cool. So um, it's, it's partly word choice, but here's the other thing I have learned in talking with educators and folks who research how kids learn about the past, 
if kids are really interested, they'll read above grade level. Mm -hmm. If kids are really interested, they'll ask questions. So long as you anticipate where some of those um, speed bumps might be and be sure that you, you know, define the words and that kind of thing, uh, use images. It's, uh, it's perhaps some of the most challenging writing I've ever done, but I really find it uh, particularly um, rewarding. Uh, I'm part of the Skype a Scientist program. And um, the, I'll send, I'll say to the teachers, well, if you want to read something, you know, your fourth graders might find this interesting. I've got one about ancient dogs that were buried with humans out in Eastern Kentucky, uh, in Western Kentucky along the Green River. The kids invariably will ask me about that. Why? Because kids have pets. They all love their dogs, right? So you get that hook and you're off to the races. Awesome. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Great question. Cool. Colleagues online, any other questions? All right. Dr. Henderson, thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording.